Welcome everybody to the latest webinar in our Stylistic Diversity series. Uh, I'm Kim Perlack, I'm the Chair of the Guitar Department, and today we have faculty and our Senior Coordinator Ian Steed talking about their experiences at Berkeley, and um, we're here to answer some questions that you may have as well. Um, so I just want to start um, by saying uh, welcome Ian, as usual. It's like a big coffee talk that we're doing, so welcome, it's good to see you. And uh, welcome to our uh, newest professors, Cecil Alexander. Hey, Cecil. Hi. And Nir Felder. Hey, Nir. Hi. Great. So one great thing about this round of stylistic diversity webinars is that we specifically chose you both because you're alumni of the school and you're new faculty members and you've studied a bunch of different things you've had a, a varied careers and now you're starting to incorporate teaching into that and so i think it's going to be really good for prospective students who probably already even before coming to berkeley are thinking about what they may do during and after their time here so it's going to be really nice to hear from both of you so um i think i would like to know i think one thing that people would be curious about right away is Coming into your faculty role, were there things that right away you knew impacted you? Things that you learned as a student had been really valuable to you when you were out in the world playing gigs or at different times, and you thought, okay, here's some things I want to make sure that I incorporate into my teaching based on my experience as a player. Um, Nir, I'm going to start with you because you've been... Um, You've been out there um, a little bit longer, and I, I wonder, like, what are some of the things that struck you that were really valuable about your guitar education? I mean, it's interesting because one of the, the reasons why I was so excited to come teach at Berkeley is that the I've been out of school for 15 years about. Um, the industry has changed so much, and, like, there were certain things that I had to learn on the job. You know things that maybe didn't exist at the time that I was a student, maybe, or somehow I didn't end up prepared for for them, and that could have been just on me or or who knows why. But I wasn't, and I learned the hard way. So I thought, hey, this is a really cool opportunity to to share this stuff with my new students, so that they don't have to learn the hard way like I did. They can go there and crush it the first time, and not have to catch it on the next go round if that if you're lucky enough for that to happen. So. Um, I just wanted to kind of do that for them. You know, I thought that that would be cool. And it's going really well so far. They're so receptive and everyone's so open to all the stuff. That's that's one of the things I love about Berkeley is like um, the openness of the, just the, the aesthetic of the institution is like just all encompassing, very open, very cool. What were some of the constant things that you think that you learned that didn't change? You know, there are, you, there are a lot of things that are going to change. And I think like one of the great skills that you've always had that I've admired is that you can adapt. So maybe you learned how to adapt a little bit while you were here, but I feel like you also developed a pretty solid core. I did learn how to adapt when I was there because I came in with an appreciation for jazz, but I also just, you know, came from blues and rock and roll. And that was my comfort zone funk and blues and, and, and rock and roll and i got to berkeley and uh was thrown into to playing jazz with some really high level players and a lot was expected of me and um i worked my butt off to try and rise to the occasion just because i was so inspired um by the people i was around and that was the greatest thing for me i'd never been around players of that caliber ever um so I think that one of the constant takeaways is that like, you know, anything you devote yourself to, whether it be like three chord rock and roll or, you know, the most harmonically sophisticated classical music or jazz, it's all of equal depth. There's like an unlimited amount of time that you could spend studying whatever your thing may be, if it's one thing or if it's many things. And the nuance and, and the level of like, sophistication of the details is pretty unlimited so whether you get into that with rock and roll or you get into that with jazz it's like a lifetime's worth of study or more we're never going to finish 
So I think I learned quickly at Berkeley that like, you know, you need to take everything, you know, you still need to have fun playing music, you know, that's like, there's got to be joy in it, but you also have to take it pretty seriously. It's like, you can't throw anything away. Like, you know, if you're going to count off a song, it better be a good count off. If you're going to respond to an email, you better do it in a professional manner. If you're going to show up to a gig, you better show up on time or early. If you're going to play this music, you have to take that music you know, seriously and really value it and, and, you know, don't just, you know, blow anything off. So, um, that's kind of something that's, you know, I've learned and it served me well. And it's like, you know, the love of the music kind of makes that happen, you know, but being around people that also love the music and care for it, um, you can work towards that common goal together. And that's very cool. See, so what about you? What, what are some things that you feel like aided you as you started your professional career that you wanted to make sure to cover with students when you started teaching? Well, I think, um, I think I stressed this when, uh, we did the coffee talk session last week, but, um, just seeing how things work in context, I think was really big for me, um, as a student. So like, rather than, uh, having an idea like exist in a vacuum almost like you know this is just what it is and that's how it's going to be like showing them recordings of someone using that idea or like you know um like if we're working on harmonic minor for example like here's uh this player using the harmonic minor scale over this chord or something like that or there here's an example of an odd time signature in a song or something like that um i think that that helped me a lot as a student um, and with a lot of students this semester, I've been talking about like, you know, not being afraid to kind of throw yourself to the lions, I guess, like <laughs> put yourself in difficult playing situations. Um, because I think that that's, that's really a, a great way to grow is just being surrounded by people who you feel like are on a higher level than you. Cause there's so much that you can gain from, I don't know, just even comping for them or being on the same stage as them or something like that, you know? Okay. I have a question for you about that. So I think one thing I've noticed about you as we've gotten to know each other and actually both of you have this in common, you're very calm and you seem very confident all the time. And what you're suggesting sounds so great, right? Like play with people who are better than you put yourself in difficult situations. Like, Feed yourself to the lions is maybe starting to get scarier, but how do you do that? How did you do that? Um, knowing that it would be difficult in some ways that it would be kind of vulnerable or that it would be maybe, um, nerve wracking to play with people who are ahead of you. How do you like, how do you work with your mindset and your preparation as you're practicing when you know that you're going to be doing that? Well, I think it, it definitely gets easier with time. Like the more you do it, the, the easier it's going to get. Um, but I think also just being focused on your growth in the long run, like rather than how uncomfortable it feels in the moment, thinking like, oh, this is really going to benefit me. Like after I get off the stage, I'm going to be aware of like this thing that I need to work on and this thing that I need to work on, you know, um, because you're doing it with other people and you're like, you know, whether you know it or not, like receiving feedback, you know, in a musical way. Nir, what about you? How do, how have you approached that? Because you always seem to be able to approach things like letting your curiosity kind of get ahead of, of your nervousness. I mean, I've definitely been so fortunate to be around people that are, you know, better musicians than I am for basically my whole career. Um, and I hope to continue to do so. It's like, like Cecil said, it's it's the best way to to grow and just to stay excited, to stay uh, enthusiastic. I mean, like, what's better than, than that? But I think maybe it might be true for both of us, or maybe for all of us here, that, like, um, there is probably some amount of, like, seeking that out, and there's a, a certain, like, recipro reciprocal amount of it coming to you because of, like you said, like what, what you kind of put out there. Um, so people that are better than you are willing to, you know, take a chance on you and put up with you <laughs> more or less while you grow, 
because of like the love that you put back into the music, the care you take of it, um, the fact that that you are you do approach it with some sort of like equanimity or calm, um, that you know you you seem ready to take on the challenge without it like stressing you out enough that you end up stressing other people out. Like people are gonna trust you with the music even though you may not be ready because they believe uh hopefully correctly that you are going to take on the challenge with grace i think that's right um and i i think that's great because it leads me to something else i wanted to bring up that we've talked about before that both of you instilled that kind of trust while you were students and i know this because your teachers have commented back um, that they started to trust you while you were really young, maybe before you even knew they did, because of the way that you each went to your lessons at totally different times, so you didn't go to school together, but you were on people's minds, each of you, um, that, you know, this person I can count on, this person comes on time, this person, um, I think that way, the way you said that puts a lot of care into the way he plays and to the, into what he's working on and is able to try things that maybe pushed you each, um, but always did it in a way that allowed everyone else in the room to be comfortable at that time. And that just was an impression that carried through years and years after you left. And um, I think it's really interesting because I'm not sure that when that happens, if if you're aware of it when it happens, but I think maybe it starts to come back to you in ways that you see because people are calling you for gigs or they're they're um, kind of trying to catch up with you. Um, Cecil, did you have a sense of that when you were a student, or when did you see it start to come back to you? Uh, I don't think that I was aware of it um, when I was a student, um, and honestly, it wasn't until that I. Um, heard from you all about the position that <laughs> that I realized that you know it was starting to come back to me I think um, but I think just to echo what what Nier said I think that um, if you treat the music with care and you know you have love for the music and you study the music really diligently I think that that hard work um, just comes through you know to someone when they're when they're sitting one-on-one -on -one with you in a private lesson or um, when you're in an ensemble or a lab or something like that. I think, I think that that patience and that diligence comes through for sure. Nir, um, what about you? What was your sense of yourself as a student? You know, I, I think like maybe similarly to Cecil, like all I was really concerned with when I was a student was taking care of the music you know, and maybe that um, registered with people. But I think it is important to like, something I try to impress on my students is that like, I think some people come in with the attitude that like, if I play great or great enough, I can conduct myself in whatever manner I want and everything's gonna work out great because I'm, you know, such and such a player. But I think, you know, the big lesson is like, how do you become a great player? It's not just made in the practice room. You have to, um, you know, un maybe unintentionally even get people to trust you so that they can put you onto the stuff that makes you, you know, throw you into these situations that you might not be ready for that get you to the next level. Um, so if people don't feel that they can trust you for whatever reason with those responsibilities, um, your chances of being this great player that you hope to become might never materialize. So there's all these factors outside of, you know, what you do on your instrument that um, add up to, you know, the greater world's perception of who you are as a musician. And I think you want to just kind of think of, uh, think about those and handle them with, you know, care and respect and everything will work out fine. <laughs> um Okay, so you have taught near, you, you're teaching here, and you've also taught college for about 10 years now, right? And so you've had this perspective now of learning whether or not you can trust 
a whole lot of students, like over 10 years. What are the things that stick out to you as a teacher that sort of telegraph to you whether or not you could trust someone professionally? Like what are the non-musical things? I mean, really, it's, it's kind of what you mentioned earlier. It's a certain calm of like, um, sitting back and watching how things work and like taking these and, or asking questions, taking mental notes, but sometimes people kind of, um, kind of blow past all the, the unsaid things mm -hmm. in a way that lets you know that they're not really paying attention. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes a comment can make someone aware, but other times it's like, it doesn't really matter how many times something is said, they're, they're just not going to be aware of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think the most impressive people are the ones that you can see are really paying attention. And then, uh, sometimes, you know, if someone, you know, takes, takes a, a critique and you see them putting the work in immediately that's also very impressive you know um what's not impressive is when someone you know is not paying attention and you point it out to them and they still don't ever manage to make a change that's troubling mm -hmm. um cecil what about you what are things that stand out for you i mean it could be something as simple as just showing up on time every week <laughs> Um, you know, doing the, the assignments, doing what's asked of you as a student. Um, but I think, you know, also what, um, just to echo what Nier said again, I think that when a student asks like really great, great questions and they seem like enthusiastic about the material, I think that that definitely stands out, um, you know, rather than just kind of assuming like, oh, I know that, can we just, you know, move on to something else? I think when they're, they're like, oh, what is, you know, how can I use this or how can I use that? I think that that, that in itself is enough to, to stand out for me. Yeah. I mean, um, Ian, I'm going to kick this to you too, because you have an, a unique perspective on this as well. Um, but I think some of the things that seem really basic are worth saying, especially for people who are listening, who are thinking about going to school for music or those of you who are in school, who are really trying to decide like, where do I put my time? always put your time in showing up on time and being prepared and being early and like sort of paying attention while you're in class, you know, so that the person who's conveying information to you, sometimes there's only four or five people in the room together. And it really stands out if you are engaged. If you decide that this is not a topic that you feel like you need to participate in, that's going to mean something later. Like, what if on a gig there's parts of the gig that aren't your favorite thing? Will you still show up and do a great job? You know, that's what we all need to know when we recommend people for things. And so it just sort of sticks in your mind. Like, who does it seem like I could trust with this? And all of those things play into it. Um, and the reason I wanted to, to uh, ask Ian is because, Ian, you... Um, came through directly also as an alum and um you're a performance major and are having your touring with your band and now you're coordinating in the department so what are some of the things you see are there there's people that you've recommended to us for some gigs that have come through and you've said things like you know i don't know how this person plays but i bet you they'd be great like let's just check on how they play and it's all based on your interactions with them so i'm wondering how someone rises to that level where you grab onto them a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there is like, I really uh, resonated with, with what uh, Nir said um, about like that, like sense of calm in somebody that like, you know, and like, like when you go to Berkeley and all your classes are like one credit, two credits, if you're taking performance classes, you're taking a lot of classes. Like everybody's really busy. And I think it's really telling, I think when people talk about how busy they are, you know, and then just like have this really frazzled energy and just be like, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just so busy. Like, oh, I just can't like, blah, blah. and it's like, it's a little overwhelming to like have that conversation with them, you know? <laughs> and it's like, everybody's kind of that busy, right? Um, and it's, 
it's such a like an interesting thing how people deal with um you know the workload that you've got and like learn to like really embrace it right as opposed to like everything is kind of just like this like next hill you have to climb and it's like this constant slog um so that's that's kind of a thing um but i'm actually curious um near and cecil like you both came through and have done like such good you know work since um and as students i'm curious as to like how like talking about how busy it is like berkeley's such a sandbox stylistically obviously that's the nature of these webinars um like how did you navigate like having so many options at berkeley like when you go to when you go to a place like berkeley i guess what my question is is like how do you figure out what you want to get out of it and how did you get it you want to take this one first cecil sure <laughs> well i think that i was when I arrived at Berkeley as a student, I was just like so thrilled to be around like so many high level musicians because I was coming from like a really small town where there wasn't really much of a music scene. So like every playing situation that I could throw myself into, I threw myself into. Like I remember the first week I was just like meeting so many new musicians and like playing jam sessions, like, you know, straight ahead jazz stuff. Um, funk stuff, pop, R&B, all of that kind of stuff. I was just like really happy to be playing music, I guess. And I think it maybe got to the point where I was like spreading myself a little thin uh, towards the end of my time at Berkeley, just like, you know, playing in a lot of groups and like always trying to be here and always trying to be there and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I really feel like after I finished, I kind of... Um, had like a new perspective and I thought, you know, maybe, um, I was going to not specialize. It's not the word I'm looking for maybe, but I had like a clearer idea of, um, like what direction I wanted to go in musically just because I had all of this experience playing in these different groups and playing with all these different people, you know? That's a great answer. Um, yeah. Um, just something that I, I just wanted to make sure that that uh, I said because Kim was talking about it as she posed the question to you, but she kept mentioning uh, things that are basic, and I really love that because um, those things are usually like, like the hardest things to do and also the most important things to do, and those are the things that we often gloss over, right? It's like everyone's like aiming for like the highest tier of stuff when this stuff is shaky, and if you have a shaky foundation, it's really hard to build high so um that really resonated with me and i wanted to say that uh ian's question um i think the important thing there is like you deciding what you want to do and sometimes it's fun to just like try things out and figure that out as you go you know because you're not really sure and you wait for something to resonate and to to do that you you might have to explore like quite a bit so i did a lot of that at berkeley i was like let me try this class let me try this class let me change majors you know like i did that a bunch because i wanted to explore and, and see what what really resonated um but then once you know what you want to do once you're like okay i want to do that it might not be one thing i want to do this and this and maybe one other thing you have three kind of focuses you really have to pursue those things Right. You have to like chase them and say, OK, you know, I want to play with singer songwriters and I also want to play jazz. How am I going to do that? And um, I think you have to, again, just going back to the music, like you have to really show people that um, you're not going to play jazz on their singer songwriter gig. And you're, you know, you're going to be able to play jazz on the jazz gig. So you really have to devote yourself to the nuances of the music and really like pursue it to its furthest end as best you can. I like those answers, and, and I think it also feeds into questions that people have about teachers, because um, I think in Berkeley, because we have this unique approach to curriculum in music schools, where you really do have a lot of free choice, and in most music schools you do not, you, you have to go deep. The depth is on you. In a lot of schools, the depth is sort of prescribed. You have someone almost micromanaging the way you practice and what you are getting done, and then to like to go broader you have to find that on your own but here it's almost the opposite so when you're figuring out kind of how you want to sound and what you want to do 
you're also working with teachers who are trying to push you beyond your comfort zone. And so you've got to work with them and really listen to them. And then you're also trying to sort of bring that into your idea for what, you know, near, like you said, oh, had these things I really wanted to accomplish. Do you have a memory of a teacher that you studied with? It could have been any of your teachers that where you had to sort of really work on things that were hard for you and then maybe talk about how you later brought that in or how that how that balance of listening to someone and doing things that are difficult for you and then still kind of bringing that towards your artistic goals that you've set. Do you want to, whoever wants to go first is okay. Nir, do you want to take this one first? Uh, yeah, I, I'm thinking, I had a lot of great teachers at, at Berkeley in the guitar department and outside. Um, I remember being like really, there was a, a teacher who I think is still at Berkeley who teaches history of Western music, Dennis LeClaire. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember just being so impressed by him because he was just so, it, it was exactly what we were just talking about of like taking whatever you choose to the furthest end. I mean, he just knew, he seemed to know like an inexhaustible amount of detail about all these things. Also all the broad strokes, but just like all, all the specific, specific details as well. And that was just really amazing. It was like someone who has chosen something and followed it through to, to I mean, there's no, there's never an end, but really followed it through like very, 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 very far past what most people get to. So I remember being really struck by that. Um, the other thing is that like, I think the best thing teachers can give you is the ability to like, kind of teach yourself and know what's best for you because your time at Berkeley or at any school is limited, right? You might never take another lesson again um, for the rest of your life, but you have to keep growing. So I had a teacher at Berkeley named Hal Crook, who was a very good teacher. Um, he's told me, you know, a lot of stuff that really helped my playing. But I remember at one point, like him making some comment about like, you guys have to do it this way. And I understood what, what, what he was saying, because it, it made sense, like if you didn't really have a concept. Of, but I remember that being a point where I was like, oh, you know what, like, that's not for me, that, that piece of advice. And I felt really good about that. Um, I felt like by that point, I had the tools to kind of think for myself and know that like, I know the intention with which the advice was given, give it a try, but also know that like, as a player, maybe I had, a, I was developing a more individual voice that like allowed me to step outside of that. And part of that, you know, confidence or whatever to, to make that decision came from like trying stuff out, like doing whatever my teachers would tell me and giving it a shot and then kind of realizing what worked for me and what didn't. And like, um, I think the best teachers will kind of impart that uh, freedom to you. You know, once you get to a certain point, it's like, okay, You've got this down, now uh, expand upon it. I like that qualification that you added, once you get to a certain point, yeah. because I think that's important that we all build the foundation. And yeah. then then your, your guides, your teachers are sort of helping you make that transition as to when you could go your own way. If yeah. you're, you're gonna let go of things, it's good that you have things to let go of, right? You know? Um, Hopefully they're guiding you to the higher level plane of like being able to teach yourself. Right. That's like something that, you know, they've already taught you these things. Now they're teaching you to teach yourself. It's like the next, right. next level. Yes, because there's that myth that you, you do four years of school and then you're all set. But no, you keep learning and you're teaching yourself and you're con constantly working with other people. Maybe your peers, maybe people older than you. Um, maybe it's formal, maybe it's informal, but we're all still learning on the instrument. Um, Nir, what about on the guitar? Uh, on the guitar, I, you know, um, a mutual friend of ours, Dave Tronzo was a fantastic teacher, um, just kind of a brilliant thinker. And, you know, he was able to take big picture things and put them into words, which is very hard to do. Um, so I really appreciated my time studying with Tronzo. It's wonderful. All right, we're going to roll back to uh, putting things into words after Cecil answers these questions, uh, because I think people are going to want some words to take home to practice. So I'm going to come back to that. Um, Cecil, what about you with your teachers? Sure. I'd also like to mention David Tronzo. 
Um, I think he was one of the, you know, he had such a big impact on me uh, when I was a student here. And he challenged me quite a bit. Uh, he was like very honest with me. Um, and we were working on some like really hard stuff, um, both complex um, or heady concepts, but also like new ways of thinking about fundamentals that I hadn't really um, addressed or hadn't really spent much time with and things like that. Um, and he was also just so knowledgeable about so much different music. And I think that that really uh, made a big impact on me in the way that I um, approach new music, the way that I approach like new concepts that I want to get into my playing, like just really digging, digging deep, I think. Um, and he was always like really um, serious about me, like being creative with the material that um, that we were talking about. And I think that that kind of set me up for, like Nir said, like teaching yourself, I think is, is the ultimate, um, that's kind of the final frontier. <laughs> Okay, so can you put your finger on a specific thing? Like, what does it look like when you go into a lesson with somebody? Like, like when you went into a lesson with David Tronzo and you said, and he was honest with you and then you had to, like, what is that moment like? What are some of the things that, like, you have specific memories, specific stories of things that you worked on in a different way in that way? And then... Um, how did that translate into your playing? Like, can you kind of take us through the process for you? I remember um, one semester we were working on um, harmonic major modes. Mm -hmm. And right away, like, uh, Tronzo expected me to be able to play them in like three octaves, like all over the neck. <laughs> Um, and when I couldn't do that, he was like, okay, for next time, um, write like an etude, like write a full page etude using uh, C harmonic major. And I was like, oh, I've like never really thought about doing that. I thought that I just, you know, drill this stuff and one day I'm going to sound like John Coltrane or something. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, having that... Um, that kind of creative element to it. Like I said in the beginning, kind of like putting things into context or like seeing how you can, you know, put it into application and maybe put your own, um, your own creative stamp on it in a way um, that really, really made a big impact on me. And that, that was like a recurring thing throughout, you know, my lessons with him was just like, okay, here's this thing that we're going to be talking about for a couple of weeks. Like, make sure you have the fundamentals down. You can play it all over the neck and everything, and then get creative with it and try to, like, make music out of it, you know? Right. Nir, what about you? When you talked about, like, putting conceptual things into words, is there something that stuck with you in that regard? Yeah, I mean, I remember a specific thing that Dave said that was really helpful for me at the time. Um, the context was that uh, I had some other professors who I became friends with and we would play every week. Uh, and they were way above my level, uh, a drummer and a pianist that, that taught at the school who were awesome. Uh, we would play every week. And uh, at the time, the pianist wanted to do a lot of difficult jazz compositions in odd times. Uh, so playing a lot in 5-4 and 7-4 and 11-4, the stuff that was already hard to begin with and I think I would just kind of retreat into my shell and be like I just I would start and I'd be like, I can't you know I just can't do it I can't make it through this solo just give up it was kind of like a way out it's like I'm not even gonna try uh, like trying would be too vulnerable I would just be like, I can't do this right and I don't know if we were talking about that but somehow it came up maybe he just knew that I needed to hear it and he was like uh He's like, whenever you're in a situation, I think he just told me this, whenever you're in a situation where like the harmony's kind of eluding you or the rhythm's too difficult or you just feel like you're kind of out of your depth, just go for it anyway. I don't know if that's like advice for everyone, but for me it was like the thing I really needed to hear because then I started going for it and it worked. I was like, oh, maybe I can do this or maybe I can learn how to do this by just 
pushing through when I think I can't make it to the other side. So that was advice I particularly needed to hear at that time. Yeah, like you had to trust yourself and give yourself permission to jump in there. Permission to like fail, yeah. you know, and just keep going. It was kind of like, I didn't feel like I was sounding good enough to even keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and this was like, it was like, no, you're, you're, you're okay. Just, you know, make it through. And it worked. Yeah. Um, also, you had to trust what you did have, right? You had to trust your tone and your fundamentals and all the things you had and just, just try to make them work in that situation. Or just trust that, like, you know, the people I was playing with would forgive me for, you know, the things that I, you know, you don't have to be like, um, I think I, I might have had this mistaken notion that, like, you have to, like, come at the musical world with, like, a suit of armor that's impenetrable and, like, you can, you have to be perfect at everything or else it's like you'll never, um, but it's actually the opposite, like, that vulnerability, that willingness to, you know, not always sound your best and, like, you know, still, still be willing to share that with the world. Uh, I think that was an important lesson. I like that there's non-musical lessons that you're both bringing up. And I love that near that when you started talking about your teachers, one of the first people who came to mind was not um, a performance based teacher, because I think that a lot of people are worried like, Oh, if I take classes that aren't really on the guitar, am I wasting my time? And that was not the case for you when you had that music history class that made a real impression on you. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I thought the subject matter was really cool to begin with, but, um, just to see someone do it so well was awesome. So it was really inspiring just to see someone just, you know, take care of the music, just like we're talking about. Cecil, what about you? Were there non-music classes or non-guitar classes that had an impact on you like that? Yeah, I think similar to what uh, Nir was saying, I took a history of um, Western music class with a teacher named uh, Peter Kennedy, um, who's a great uh, historian of the music and an amazing trumpet player um, as well. Um, and I was amazed because I kind of had the impression that, oh, like I'm taking this class with this jazz guy and like, you know, we're just going to be talking about jazz and all that kind of stuff. Um, but he, you know, just covered the entire spectrum of everything. And I was like, wow, I can't believe that this guy, you know, this jazz trumpet player knows all this stuff about this music and this music. And I think that that really made an impact on me that you have to... Um, not just be familiar with the lineage and the canon of what you resonate with the most, but like everything that leads up to that as well, you know. I'm really glad you said that because I think um, there's a perception that as life becomes more and more modern, it almost becomes harder to trace your lineage musically. Because when things were less accessible, it was almost like you had to go on this scavenger hunt to find things, or you had to be in touch with your teacher and your teacher's teacher and, you know, literally get the book that was passed down. And now that everything is there, sometimes it's harder to convince students that it's a good idea that, well, who, okay, I love this playing. Well, where does it come from and who influenced it and who were the, where, where are all the branches of the tree? Um, so like Cecil, how do you explore that yourself and how do you, um, get your students listening like that? Well, you know, what I found with, um, I guess my, my own development, um, was if I was checking out, you know, say, um, some modern player and I was kind of like trapped in. Uh, maybe like a listening bubble where I was just like, oh, this guy's like the best thing since sliced bread. And like, you know, all of his ideas are just like totally unique to him. And then I would find some recording of somebody that he listened to or they listened to. And I would say, oh, like I can see all of these qualities in this person's playing are like from different sources, you know. And I think that that in itself just kind of inspired me to keep going further and further and further back, you know. Um, like for example, you know, one of my favorite guitar players is, um, Grant Green 
And if I listen to Charlie Christian, I hear a lot of Grant Green's playing in that, like his rhythmic approach, the way he phrases and uh, even his tone, you know. Um, and I, I think with like what you mentioned about um, things getting more and more modern, it's kind of like easier to get um, farther away from the source, you know. But I think the best way to do it is just like starting with what resonates with you the most and then kind of, you know, backtracing, I guess. It's like rather than saying, okay, I'm going to start with like Gregorian chants and then I'm going to work my way up to Duke Ellington or something like that. <laughs> You know, starting with um, with what you like and then seeing like, oh, I can see qualities of this and this thing that happened 40 years prior, or 30 years prior or something like that. You know, that's great. I Yesterday, Ian knows that uh, I went with Cheryl Bailey. We went out to Western Mass and visited Jack Pazzanelli, who is a professor who retired last year. And um, when we got there, we had brought a bunch of books and papers and stuff from school and we just ended up going through music all day and he had a stack of recordings and they were he used to play with Jim Hall so there were some of the old recordings of him and Jim Hall and him and Larry Coryell and and then some of, and then he traced those back like to what those guys were doing before him and then he had he was like I made a playlist listen to these young guys from the Netherlands and they were super young like maybe 20 maybe 20 I was like, how did you even find these people? He's like, check it out. And then he was cross-referencing. Like, look, that's like this, and this is like this, and put that rock record in, and check this thing out. And it was the fun part about it that I think when people think of history, for whatever reason, sometimes people think it's dull, but it was the most fun. You know, we had the best time. And, and Nir, I know you do that when you listen, because every time we talk about things that um, you're doing or you're into, you you have that little bit of excitement of listening to new things. So how, how do you approach this? I'm just always curious. I mean, at this point, I probably learn as much from my students as they learn from me about stuff to check out, right? Because they have access to this whole other world that, you know, I didn't come up with. So I, I like to share the stuff that I've discovered. And I also, I think they really appreciate it when I'm attentive to their suggestions and like make an effort to check it out. Um, I think maybe that like gets them to trust me a little bit more when I'm like, hey, you should check this out. Um, yeah, it's just a, just a, a love of music. It, it you know, I, I want to hear what's good. You know, wh whatever it is, like you know, even if it's not my wheelhouse, like it might inspire me um, in all these different ways. So I'm definitely pro checking out all the music. I like what you said about students, too, because I feel like, you know, there's times when everybody can get stuck, you know. Um, we had a friend here used to say, um, every rut started out as a groove, right? So Yeah, wow. They, yeah, right? And um, But then a, a young person comes in or, like, someone comes in with a fresh perspective and they're like, hey, check this out. And then it kind of opens, the sun comes out, right, for everybody. So I think it could be a really fun and a really valuable, valuable endeavor to keep checking things out. Um, yeah, I think it's important for us, like old, old, <laughs> old heads, to, um, you know, just like not because students come in and they're so passionate about usually something that's like very new and they haven't checked out the old stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, I definitely don't want to be the guy that rains on their parade and says, "Well, that's not really good. Like, you should listen to." This stuff is this is the real stuff, you know. Uh, I think that that's lame, you know, because uh, they're excited about it because it's like, you know, flipping all these switches for them. Um, so I think that if they see that you're willing to like, you know, meet them there, then they'll be like, oh, well, what are you checking out? Hmm. Yeah. So near, what's important to you about your playing? Like, what what are some central things? Like, are there things about your tone? Are there things about your technique or the meeting places there or phrasing or like what what about your musical values as a player oh it's such a big question um, i know yeah it's all the ba you know it's all the basic things like i want it to feel good so the the time has to be in a certain place i want it to have like a certain um sound i want it to sound good so yeah i'm thinking about my tone and and um I've explored, you know, the options that are available to me and found one that I believe in. Um, I was working with a student the other day who's a great 
player and trying to get him to like take some more risks you know and I think he was very afraid to because he was afraid he wouldn't sound good anymore and like he played and uh I think the general sense of like even though some things like he might have played some notes that didn't fit the chord or whatever who cares like the sense of excitement and discovery in his playing was like really fresh and it made him feel like something really special that he may have not felt before so I like that uh, experience for myself I'm always trying to find new stuff and sometimes I fail but even when I fail I feel like the value of like the search maybe outweighs the value of playing something that I've you know played before and know sounds good um so yeah sense of adventure and risk and the joy of discovery and uh you know submitting to the moment uh all those things are I think important to me and just I like a rootedness too like a groundedness like the stuff we're talking about I like that uh I you know I first started out as like an aspiring blues player um so I'd listen to some folks that I think were pretty grounded and, you know, and just making music sound good and not really caring about the, um, you know, theoretical component to it. It was just like, this sounds good. Let's do it. So I, I still, I still love that. What about you, Cecil? What are some of your values in your own playing? Um, well, like I, like Nier said, I think, um, a certain like groundedness, in your approach, um, like rhythmically, you know, the way that you phrase and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I also kind of just based on musicians that I like to listen to a quality that they all have is that, um, it sounds like they're on the edge of their seat a little bit. Like they're very relaxed in the way that they, um, like it doesn't sound like they're trying to get a sound out of the instrument, but it sounds like they're really like reaching for new things. Um, and I, I don't know, I'd like for that to come through. I don't know if it always does. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just want to like get a good sound out of the instrument, um, acoustically, electrically, and make it sound like I'm um, not being forceful, I guess, with the way that I play. That's a great point. And to both of you, how do you work on your technique and your tone production together? How do you approach that? Um, because I think for both of you, you're, you're known to be expressive players and to be really relaxed with your technique, even when you're playing virtuosic things. And um, people often remark about your, both of your tones. And I think sometimes younger players think of those things as separate, right? You think of like running data and and sort of technical things on the fretboard and then oh and then i'll work on my sound or my dynamics but but we know that those things are are one so how do you do that to get the sound that you want like near how do you do that i think that like you know if you put dynamics kind of at the forefront you're forced to play sort of relaxed because um if you're playing here, there's nowhere to go, right? If you're playing like full tension, there's nowhere to go up. So if like, you know, having dynamics in your playing, which I think is so crucial and important and wonderful, um, if that's something that's, if that's one of your priorities, um, then you're kind of going to have to kind of stumble upon it. You know, for me, I think technique usually follows uh, the musical concept. It's like, I want to do this thing. How do I make it work? Um, it, it's, I've never been technique first. I, I think I've tried it, you know, I've been like, what if I, what if I just work on chops? It never works out for me. It's like, it's not enjoyable or d doesn't produce the results I want either. But if I put the music first and I'm like, I want it sound like this, I think the technique usually follows. Cecil, what about you? Yeah, I think a definitely a big part of it is just um, letting the music determine what you do technically rather than um, just kind of practicing technical ideas isolated, I think. Mm -hmm. um, because when I've tried to do that, like when I just try to I don't know, drill uh, spider exercises or something like that on the fretboard. Um, I notice all these other areas of my playing kind of like 
going down, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that that's definitely a big part of it. Um, I also just think practicing in a relaxed way um, creates like a, a pleasant sound on the instrument, you know, and that there's a lot of different sounds that you can get out of the instrument. But I think as long as you're practicing in a way that's tension free, that's going to come through to a listener. Um, and I also just think like checking out recordings and trying to play along with people whose tone you admire, you know, um, not from like a, you know, what kind of effects is that person using uh, perspective, but just like, how are they really attacking the strings? Like, what is their uh, pick attack like? Like, how are they fretting the notes? You know, where are they playing? Are they playing close to the neck? Are they playing close to the bridge? Um, and I think just trying to like, almost insert yourself into a recording and like play along with Wes Montgomery or play along with uh, Kenny Burrell or somebody like that and just trying to play your ideas but with their um, approach to tone and timbre and touch and all that stuff. You know, we're coming to the end of the webinar and I want to ask all three of you this question. For people who are prospective students who are listening, do you have one piece of advice, just pick one for what to think about as you're kind of thinking about maybe what to play in your audition and how to approach your audition. Um, Ian, why don't you go first? Because you've heard, Ian has heard now thousands of placement auditions uh, when people come in, right? So um, what do you think people should think about, Ian? What's one thing? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I've heard faculty talk about it, and I've also heard students who are or prospective students rather talk about what they think they're going to play, and they might might have gotten advice from somebody um, who went to Berkeley, you know, thirty years ago, um, and they have a conception of what they ought to play or what the faculty are like and what they're expecting, and that really doesn't seem to be at all accurate. Um, so, I mean, I guess the the thing that students ought to be doing when they audition is to play something that they really, really enjoy and like and is honest about what they wanna play, right? Because I knew a kid who was a burning blues player, like burning, and he went in with a D28 and he tried to play chord solo. And it's like, man, that's not what you do. <laughs> like, you blow these guys' heads off with the stuff that you actually do, you know? Um, so that's what I would say. Like, what you really enjoy playing is what's going to come out the most. I think that's gr that's a great answer. Um, what's your quick answer, Cecil? Well, I think... Um... Yeah, definitely playing music that resonates with you, um, but also picking music that um, highlights your strengths, you know? Um, I think that those are kind of, they can be like two related things, but there's also like some um, some qualities of both of those that are a little, a little separate. Like, um, I don't know, for my audition, I played um, Little Wing by Jimi Hendrix, but I took like, like a bebop solo over <laughs> just because those were two two things that i was really into i was like really into the way that um that hendrix played all of those like kind of you know r b embellishments is what we know them as now but i was also into like pat martino and george benson and people like that so um yeah just playing in a way that that highlights your strengths i think mm, that's great near what's your 10 second answer to that question Ian already stole my answer. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, I, I mean, I think that, you know, even more important that, you know, that what Ian said is just generally true across, across the board. I think you should play the music that you believe in, that you love, and, and never play to impress anybody because that's a losing mm -hmm. battle. Again, like, you don't know what their reaction is going to be. So usually when you try to impress somebody, they're going to end up unimpressed. Whereas if you were to just do what you love and believe in, that's what's going to, you know, have that effect anyway. But it's just what you should be doing because it's what you love. I think that's great. And I mean, usually that would be the great place to end. And Cecil, you might have a student at two. Um, but we have a really awesome, thoughtful question. And so I'm gonna ask it. And then Cecil, if you wanna give your quick answer and then go teach your student who's, I think his head I can see in the window behind you. Um, 
But uh, Nir, do you have a couple minutes maybe to hang and answer this question? I can hang for a couple minutes, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so he, this is a question from Alexander, and he says, I'm a guitar player, but I'm also trying to become a producer after Berkeley. And I want to work in many different aspects of the music business. So as you all have said before, I'm trying to go as deep as possible in production and arranging and reach the next level. The thing is, I'm struggling to find the time to practice guitar as much as I want to because of that. I want to finish Berkeley being as good as I can be on the guitar. What advice do you have to balance those different aspects of music? Also, I have learned guitar alone most of my life, so I'm not very good at taking lessons and knowing what to ask. So those are great questions in there. Um, and I just want to open by saying quickly that I had the chance to work as a producer professionally for a few years, and everything I did on the guitar was such an asset. It instantly became like super skills. And um, you know, when you're practicing your instrument, especially for us, I think because it's a contrapuntal instrument, you can play all the different parts, you're learning how to hear on such a deep and specific level. So when you're in the studio and people need to know, are these parts balanced? Can you hear a difference between yesterday and today? Do we have to throw out those takes and start over? Um, is one part working? Are things too muddy? Do you need to change timbres here or there? Often it's people who can play really, really well who can hear those things on a different level. So I would say the first opening to that is that it's a great idea to balance both. Um, Cecil, what strikes you about that? Like, how do you how do you balance so that you can practice and develop other areas of your musicianship? And how do you learn how to ask good questions and lessons? Yeah, I think just finding where um, the two worlds can kind of intersect, I think, is the biggest thing. Um, like, how can you combine? Um, or how can, I, how can you use your time so that you're working on like both things at once almost? Um, that was something that I found with, because uh, I was a jazz composition major for like the last half of my time at Berkeley. Um, and I was also just trying to like, you know, get good at guitar like anybody else, I think. Um, so I was like writing things that challenged me as a guitar player because I was always playing on my projects. So. You know, if that was some um, technical thing that I wanted to work in, I would um, write that into a, a 10 minute episodic composition that I had to get together for some class or something like that. So that would be my advice. <laughs> cool. Cecil, we're going to let you go if you have a two o'clock lesson, and then we're going to okay. get here to answer the question. Thank you so much, Cecil. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. Nir, what about balance? What do you do? I'll take a quick stab at it. Um, uh, just you know, to whoever asked the question, just know that you're you know you're definitely not alone in that. Uh, I think we all struggle to achieve all the different things that we want to achieve that sometimes feel like have you know opposing demands of our schedule. Um, I think one thing that helps is to plan ahead. You know, if you know that you're going to need to get something done, or you know you're going to need to do it time management really, really helps. So uh, will you get unlimited time to do the things that you want to do? No, but if you schedule some time and keep it kind of sacred, you will get that guitar time. Maybe it's just an hour a day, maybe it's an hour a week, uh, maybe it's an hour a month, whatever it is. Um, it might not be as much as you want, but you will get some. Whereas if you don't schedule ahead, you might get none or get less. So, you know, schedule ahead and be protective of that time. Uh, that's one thing and then also just be aware that like like I said like we're all going through this and there are definitely like seasons for different things so there might be a time when you focus more on composition a time where you focus more on performing a time you focus more on recording a time you focus more on all these things and they all add up to the musician that you are um, and it, that's okay you know it's you can't be doing all things uh, at once especially when you're out there in the working world I think that's a great answer and I think the integration of everything in your mind is really helpful. So the more you listen, the better producer you're going to be. The more you listen to yourself, the better you can listen to other people. In terms of time management, 
and, and knowing what questions to ask. Like when you're at Berkeley, in your private lessons, you have to work on what we call the proficiency material, which is all of your core fundamental vocabulary on the fretboard. So you can ask your teacher, how do I structure practicing this so that I'm the most efficient? So like Nir was saying, you know, maybe you don't need as much time as you think you do. Maybe what you need is focused time. When you're going to your arranging classes, you could always be thinking like, how would that sound if I'm in the studio? What would that, what would I want to take out? What would I want to put back in? What would I want to enhance? And the same thing with everything, you're kind of approaching it from the perspective of both things, like a listener, producer, and as a player, because I think it's also cool to be able to play on tracks. You might not be able to always find the people you want. You might, if you could play on both ends, if you could play and produce, that would be really great. But I think to think of them integrated is really helpful in that. And and then I think with questions too, questions will come to you because your teacher is going to give you stuff to work on. And then as you're working on it, if you don't know how one thing relates to the other, if you don't understand how deep to go, um, these are things you should just ask. If you feel underwater with something or you don't feel like you're getting enough out of something or you feel like I'm spending so much time on these projects in the studio. How do I think about this in a different way to make it relevant? You know, there's the questions will start to ask themselves, I think. Um, Ian, what do you think about that real quick? Yeah. Also, I wanted to say that we, I actually asked this question on every episode of our podcast. What should students be asking that they might not think to ask? So uh, definitely listen to that and hear what your guitar teacher, who's probably already been interviewed, has to say about that. And a ton of other guitar teachers uh, here at Berkeley um, have to say about what, <laughs> about good questions to ask and what you should be thinking about. So that's like a whole trove of good stuff in there. That's a great point, Ian. Um, Nir, do you have any final thoughts for people before we kind of sign off of the, of the hang today? I think we've had a wonderful discussion that's covered a lot of ground. I don't know if I have anything to add other than that um, this was such a pleasure talking with you guys about like the big picture things, which I think are uh, deserving of, you know, the majority of our attention. You know, the, the, the small details fill themselves in. But um, I think that like thinking big picture mm -hmm. of, of who you are as a musician is like the way to answer your own questions about the things you need to be working towards. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think this is such a nice hang to get to have at this time in the semester where everything feels really overwhelming to everybody and everybody feels out of balance. So it was an awesome question that Alexander asked. It's kind of the, the question that I wanted to know the answer to today. <laughs> and to, you know, to know that there isn't an, a good answer that's just the answer to the question. Um, I think that you and Cecil Near you, and Ian, you guys um, very kindly and very thoughtfully threw that out there, that we're always all continuously learning and asking ourselves these questions. So um, Forever. Forever, and we're all in it together. I mean, you know, Near, people don't need to hear that we met a bunch of years ago, but I, I still get a kick out of the fact that we have, like, some shared history, you know, and Ian, too. I mean, like, you know, that... We all kind of stick around together, hopefully. Yeah, Kim, you were the first class in my first semester. <laughs> you were the teacher. I remember that. I remember you in that I class. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and uh, I remember. I remember Nero. It was my it was my first year of teaching in the summer workshops. Wow, I didn't know that was your first year. Yeah, and you were so excited, and you were like. So on it, I was like, okay, that guy's with us, you know, <laughs> as a student. <laughs> so I think that's really cool. Um, so I'm glad that we got to hang and share all this. And, and if you're listening to this as usual, you can go um, to our Coffee Talk playlist. And as Ian said, you can go right through all the Coffee Talks. Um, just you can check out more of Nier's story with the guitar in his episode and Cecil's, which will be coming up soon. And, um, you know, spend some time with the teachers and realize you're not alone in your questions. And um, I think that's that's what we've got today. Right. Um, check out our YouTube. You can go practice with uh, the faculty there on their tracks. You can hang out with us on Instagram and um, 
and we'll see you on the next hang. Um, coffee cheers, Nir and Ian, and thank you, Cecil, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone.